Recorded live. I'd like to welcome everyone to this Wednesday, May 28, 2014. Uh, welcome to NTT's Kingdom of God with the Eyes of Equity. Uh, welcome to uh, Live a Kingdom Life, and welcome to Back to Eden Project. I'm your host, Christian Walters. We left off on scriptures out of Romans chapter 6. We just got done discussing chapter 3 and 4 in Romans. And we were really talking about God's plan of salvation. So we'll get into that. But first I'd like to kind of review what we've covered so far in the last couple of shows. And the first two shows went over what I believe and what the scriptures say is what I believe. And it's really the, the doctrines of of faith, which is the scriptures alone, number one. And number two, it's Christ alone. Number three, it's grace alone. Number four is faith alone. Number five is all to God's glory. And those doctrines of faith are what is needed to a correct interpretation of the scriptures. That's part of it. In order to use the scriptures as a filter for your life, for doing your deeds or your actions, you need a standard by which to live. And that standard is an outside view, non-experiential or non-experienced event. It's a standard that I don't have myself, but a standard that is outside of me, somewhere in kingdom, in God's mind, that's where the standard comes from. And that standard is really the wisdom of God, or is, his, his, is really his essence, and his essence is his wisdom. And his wisdom is really his equity. And it's all about equity. If you understand what equity is, you will have the eyes of discernment. You will have the wisdom to know how God thinks. How, how God himself comes up with his decisions. Now, you might not know his purpose or his plan, but you can know how he came about, how he decided those things. His very essence is his spirit, and his spirit is equity. And equity is his wisdom. Equity is also Christ. Christ is God's equity. And Christ is my righteousness, and righteousness is equated with equity. Christ is my equity. So this equity is really the key, and that's why the title of this program is The Kingdom of God with the Eyes of Equity, really. Because you have to put on the eyes of equity. You've got to put on the wisdom of God. And just exactly what is that wisdom? What is that equity? Well, here's a good definition what equity is. Now, I just love this quote. The one I've been saying for years, it comes out of John Bouvier's Institutes of American Law, 1882, and it's Volume 2, Section 3724, Paragraph 4, which states, it's going to state what equity is. And here's the quote, law is nothing without equity, and equity is everything even without law. That statement alone says it right there. Continuing on, those who perceive what is just and what is unjust only through the eyes of the law never see it as well as those who behold it with the eyes of equity. Law may be looked upon in some manner as an assistance for those who have weak perception of right and wrong. In the same way, the optical glasses are useful for those who are short-sighted or whose visual organs are deficient. Equity, in its true and genuine meaning, is the soul and spirit of the law. Soul and spirit of the law. Positive law is construed and rational law is made by it. John Bouvier, Institutes of American Law, 1882, Volume 2, Section 3724, Paragraph 4. That's the most complete 
definition of equity of outside sources other than the scriptures themselves. And we're going to be getting more into where equity is in the scriptures as we go along. Because really that's what the kingdom of God is all about. And Christ always taught about the kingdom of God while he was here. The kingdom of God is this. The kingdom of God is that. He quoted the kingdom of heaven is this. The kingdom of heaven is that. Depends on which book you're reading. But it's basically in the first five narratives. And the first five narratives are narrating what Christ taught. And it's the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and including the narrative Acts. At one time, Acts was part of. These were called the narratives. And the narratives contain the teachings or discourses of Christ in his kingdom, what the kingdom is and what the kingdom is all about. It's the kingdom principles, and there's where we come back to equity again. As far as I can see, one of the biggest ones is really Matthew 7, 12, which is really the summation of all the law and the prophets, the Pentateuch. And it basically says, do unto others as you have them do to you. That's the same thing as the first maxim in equity, which is he who comes into equity must be doing equity. We're going to get more into equity from uh, man's understanding from books like Gibson's and Pomeroy and Phelps and different other books, of uh, older books like Bouvier that, that teach about what equity is, but they're not quite 100% right because you really have to go to the horse's mouth. The horse's mouth is the scriptures. And we go to 712 in Matthew. That is the first maxim. Because there's no better source than the actual original source. And that's where we're going. And that's basically why we have changed direction under NTT, New Trust Technology, and we've gone into a change of format. We really haven't changed direction. We've been going the same way, but we just like stopped for a while moving forward. And now we picked up and we start moving forward again. And it really comes down to what I've been trying to explain in the past uh, couple shows was why we're changing the format. And I I still don't know whether I've explained it fully enough why we've really changed directions, but it basically boils down to this. The merging of titles under a trust and the extinguishment of the debt or the obligation is not the uh, problem. So the immediate action that you've got before you, the charge, the foreclosure, the uh, whatever that you're being charged with legally is, is not your problem. Your problem is you're living in one of two systems. You're living in a public system. You're living in a legal system. You're living in a, a fiction world of make-believe. That's a false system. It's antichrist. It's satanic. It's a system based on commerce. It's a system based on money. And it's evil. The kingdom of God does not operate on money, period. We walk on gold and silver, but gold and silver is not money in the kingdom. It's a mineral. It's a substance. It's when you turn the gold and silver into money and use it as money, that's the worship of the love of money. And that's what the commerce realm does. Jesus threw out the money changers in the temple, saying that this was a house of prayer, not a house of commerce. God's kingdom does not operate on money, does not operate on a commercial system, period. So it's the system, the system that everybody is tied up in. That system is the 666, and everybody's taking the mark, whether they know it or not. That mark of the beast, the commercial number that you must have to do a buy or sell transaction, is the evil. And God's kingdom, again, does not operate by money. 
it operates in a totally different principle called equity and loving your neighbor as yourself. He who comes into equity must be doing equity. Well, what is it I must be doing to do equity, to get equity to act for me? In other words, why are, is the windows of heaven, its blessings, the windows are not open for Christians? I'll tell you why. Very basically is they're living in the wrong system. They're living in a satanic system worshiping another god. They're worshiping false idols. And Deuteronomy 28, verse 8 says that they got a cursed mind, a mind of confusion. What's the mind of confusion? You don't have any discernment. You can't tell the difference between one system from another system. And those two systems that you must discern are the kingdom of God versus the Antichrist or the satanic system that's in place utilizing commerce. And even in the churches, you're bringing in your tithes based on commerce, which is not what God wants. Just like Cain was told by, by God, hey, I don't like your sacrifice. I won't accept it. I reject your sacrifice. You can't give God anything derived by commercial means. And he especially doesn't want your money. You can't tithe your money to God. He rejects it. What he really wants is he wants your time in loving your brother as yourself. Fulfilling the needs of others and thereby filling your own account by your giving. Philippians 4, starting at 13 and forward, explains the account that God has set up and how the account works. It's based on your giving. Everybody looks at an empty bucket and says, hey, I can't give out of an empty bucket. What? I don't have anything to give. Well, let's take the feeding of the 5,000. Let's take the empty bucket that Christ had that he blessed and multiplied it up and fed the 5,000. So don't tell me you don't have an empty bucket because everybody's got something and that something, those blows and fishes, is your time. That is your actual money. But how are you using your time? How are you using your money? Actually, it's not money at all. It's your time. Remember that. How are you using your time? Are you using it for commercial purposes? Then you're not using it in a right godly manner. No wonder nobody has anything because the whole commercial system is designed to rob, kill, and destroy you. And it does. I listen to people when I go out at the restaurants and I hear their conversations while I'm eating my meal quietly. And uh, what are they talking about? Money. They ain't got enough of it. They know how to get more of it. Bills are so much. The debt load is killing us. That's because you're living in the wrong system. Romans 12, 1 and 2, especially number 2, talks about the changing of the mind, the attitude that you must have so that your reasoning process has changed so that you have a different system system in place changed by your thinking because your thinking is your ability to choose the righteous system over the non-righteous system or the equitable system over the commercial system, the public system, the system that's in place for you babysitting you as a ward. It's actually the judgment of God upon us because it's the two by four hitting you in the head, getting you to wake up so that you get out of here. It's a signpost telling you to get out of here. Get out of this iniquity that you're in. It's equity versus iniquity. It's this change of mind to be able to put on the eyes of equity so that you can see clearly God's kingdom. Romans 12.2 Put on those eyes of equity so that you can see clearly God's kingdom in reference to good and evil. What's the good kingdom, which is the bad kingdom? And it all comes about by Romans 1, which is by the mercy and graces of God. And what is that mercy and grace of God? That's equity. 
And he says, this is your spiritual act of worship, which is really equity. Equity is your spiritual act of worship. Because Romans 12.1 is setting it up, what your spiritual act of worship is. And then after that, in Romans 12.2, it says what the act really is. What is the, that you're supposed to put on the eyes of equity, the understanding of equity, God's wisdom? That's what it's all about, and that's basically why we've changed format, because your foreclosure of your home, your foreclosure of your car, the charges you're being hit with is really due to an iniquity that you're living, a lifestyle of commerce, choosing the wrong system and living by it, living by a false idol, and you have a mind of confusion and you're not blessed. You're living in a poverty status. You're spiritually dry, and you can ask nothing of God that he will give to you because your spiritual act of worship is wrong. Choose this day which God or which idol you're going to serve, which system you're going to serve, God's kingdom that does not operate by money, or the public system that does. Well, you'll say, fine. I won't be able to put that system off until I can see whether or not I can put this other system on. In other words, what you're really saying is, i got to eat. And if I can't find a way to eat, then I'm going to participate in the same sin that I'm committing. Boy, if that isn't foolish, that is really the test. The test is really, will you live by principles? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for principles, for godly principles? Because really, if you did, just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego said, I will not bow down and worship your God even if tomorrow we get thrown in the fiery furnace and we burn up. How many Christians out there have that kind of faith? That kind of principle that they live on and believe and they implement that. Because I don't believe God will allow you to perish if you live by equitable principles. He will show up in your fiery furnace. And he will be that third member amongst you. You see, we don't worship God the way he requires. We think, we think that we should worship God the Canaanite way. And God says, sin is knocking at your door. If you do what is right, and what would be right? Putting on the eyes of equity. Changing your reasoning. If you do what is right, will not your countenance be lifted up? That's why Cain killed his brother. Wasn't doing the right sacrifice, was depressed, angry. Angry at what? He himself was causing this problem himself. And that's what we're doing. We're choosing the wrong system. Saying that we don't, you know, have a problem, but we really do. It's like the beach sand. You're like looking at one grain of sand on the beach. Just one. And it's likened to yourself. And you... Don't see you have a problem because you're looking at one grain of sand on the beach. But there's many grains of sand on the beach that you're ignoring and how vast the other sands are. And you look at that one sand in reference to yourself and you don't see that you have a problem. But you see, there's other grains on the sand that do have a problem which you don't see. And you don't think you have a problem because those problems don't affect you. 
but yet you're still on the same system, the same beach. You've got the same problem. The winds and waves are coming in and washing your sand away out to sea. And you're in the deep, and you're lost. And the house that you build on that sand is shifting sands, and your house doesn't stand. Because you didn't build your house on an equitable principle. And you don't see yourself as having a problem. So you ignore the problem. And when it affects you finally, when the waves crash and pull your house down, it's too late. You've lost your house. Your foundation's been swept away. It was made of sand. There was nothing solid there that was equitable that lasted. There's no sound principles in which you operate on. But you can get it back. You can change systems. You can renew your mind. You can do a Romans 12, 2 change. Put the eyes of equity on. So that you can clearly see, discern between God's right and wrong system. And then the God's heaven's windows would be open, pouring out your blessings upon you and your brothers. And if your mind is in line with Christ, and Christ is always in line with the God the Father, it's like connecting two pipes together. The water flows. And you can have anything that you ask of him, because you wouldn't ask of him anything that wasn't equitable to begin with. And equity would be his will. That's what's so amazing about the study of NTT, what has taken us from the beginning of the journey. It was, I've said it all along from the beginning. When we started studying trust and found out equity was administered in trust, in, or trust was administered in equity, excuse me. And it was really the equitable basis of trust. And what about God's private trust that he has with man? Isn't that equitable also? You bet your sweet booty it is. But we're far from the understanding of that wisdom. But I see a great spiritual awakening happening upon the waters, upon the land, where the Holy Spirit is moving like it did in Acts, drawing believers to the truth and unlocking their minds from the bondage of the confusion that their minds are locked into. There is a spiritual awakening happening. And there is a great planting of equitable seeds today in the minds of believers. Drawing them to a kingdom that is Christ, that is God the Father's. Welcome to the kingdom of God with the eyes of equity and how to live a kingdom life and the Back to Eden Project. I'm your host, Christian Walters. Now, we have a new no, new showtime on, on Monday at 10 p.m., although you really don't have to tune into it at 10 p.m. There's no live show going on. It's the same talk show number. It's the 724-444-7444. And the PIN number to get in there is the ID number is 133504. But you can get on there at any time and get a download from from this. Because as soon as we get done here on this Wednesday, we post it up on there as soon as we can. So we left off discussing the God plan of salvation. And I've said that there's three dimensions to the the plan, or three elements, or three divisions, and you can't commingle them. In other words, you can't take something from the one compartment and cross it over in the other compartment, or vice versa. They're non-commingable. If you do, you breach the trust, and you have a wrong interpretation. So if you take those filters, those five elements, scriptures alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, all of God's glory alone, 
and use those combined with the understanding that salvation is under three tenses or three dimensions. Past tense, present tense, future tense. Now, I've gone over the, few, uh, the first two tenses, but we're going to review it again. The first tense is justification, or first dimension. Justification. Second tense, or second dimension, is salvation is, of salvation is sanctification. And the third tense, or the third dimension of salvation, is glorification. Now, I went over where those are, and I went over the scriptures in that. Justification, the first tense, is in Romans chapter 3 and 4, basically. It starts at Romans 3.19 uh, and goes forward to, through 4, chapter 4. That's the first tense. First tense is justification. Second tense we went over is Romans chapter 6 and 7. Six and seven is sanctification tense, or sanctification dimension. And the last one, the third one, is glorification, and that's chapter eight. Chapter eight. Now notice three and four, six and seven, and eight. We missed one, five. Five is kind of like a special one. We'll just kind of mention it, but we won't go through it. Five is basically the results of justification, the first tense, chapter three and four. Because when you become justified, everything's set right, and you are imputed with righteousness, or you are imputed as being equitable with God, because righteousness is synonymous with equity. The result of this justification is chapter 5, which is really peace with God. That's basically what chapter 5 is all about. That God is no longer at war with you because you're justified. And you're justified by faith alone. So chapter 5 is the result of justification, peace with God. God is no longer at war with you. It's not that you're at war with God. No, it's that God's no longer at war with you. That's what really counts. God now loves you. He treats you as as Christ. You're in the Christ likeness. You're in Christ and Christ is in you. The in Christ principle. So, three and four results in chapter five. And then when you get through chapter five, then you come to chapter six and seven, which is the next tense. That's sanctification. Now, that's present tense. Not past tense, present tense. First First tense is past tense, justification. 2,000 years ago, I, along with all other believers, were nailed to the cross with Christ. That's past tense. Done in the past. Can't be changed. Can't put anything with it. It was all Christ's work, not my work, not any of your works. That gets you peace with God in chapter 5, and we go on and move to chapter 6, which is sanctification. Present tense. Now, we're all presently living in this tense, sanctification. Now, what is sanctification? Chapter 6, Romans. Now, this is to the believers who are dead to sin and alive to God. Chapter 6 says, verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through the baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, it's all about a knowledge of God, knowing this. It's not about a feeling. I don't feel anything about God. No, it's about a knowledge of him. And he's trying to give you a knowledge through the written scriptures. If it's interpreted right, you're on the right track. 
It's about a knowledge of him. So knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. The sin principle. O death, where is your sting? If I've been crucified with Christ, he was resurrected, I'm going to be resurrected also. And death has no sting. But what is it that we're putting on here? And what is it that we're knowing? And how are we buried with him? And how are we going to walk this newness of life? And what is this newness of life? This is the putting off of the old system and the putting on of the new system. But have Christians actually done that? See, the Christ walk is putting off the old system and putting in place the new system in it. And you don't have to walk that old system. You've been free from the principle of sin. You no longer have to do that system because you've been justified and you have peace with God. And it's your sanctification walk, your sanctification process that you're going through all your present tense life that must change. You must put that old way off and put the new way on. Otherwise, your spiritual act of worship is wrong. If you want to walk in that newness of life, if you want to be united with him, You have to know these things, that you're crucified with him. And you do away with that old nature, that old system, and you live in a different system. Otherwise, you're not free. You're still operating as a slave. Verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is a master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know, fortunately, if you don't do this type of walk, Christ is going to complete it for you. But you're going to be the one gnashing and wailing of teeth in heaven as a believer, saying, crying your eyes out about your position because you're a lowly ground pounder. You're the private in the kingdom because you didn't sacrifice your life for Christ. You believed, but And death no longer has a master over you, but you didn't do the walk. You didn't do the death that he died. And you didn't do the life that he lives. He lives to God, do you? Well, most Christians would say, yeah, we do. But no, you don't understand. You're like that one grain of sand on the beach, and your house is swept away. You're living in a system that you've been taught all your life. You're like born in a barn, raised in a barn all your life. And when somebody comes up to you and says, you stink. You say, what are you talking about? I don't stink. I don't smell a thing. Well, the reason why you don't smell a thing is you've been in the barn too long. You don't recognize the system you're in. It stinks, people. Get out of there. You're not living for God. You're living for commerce. You're living in an antichrist system. You put the 666 on. You're not alive to God in Christ Jesus. You're alive to Satan. 
You're doing the old life. You haven't made a change at all. You just believed. There was no change. You didn't change from one system to another. You just continued on the same way, doing your own same thing. Well, there are rewards for that. You're the lonely private ground pounder in heaven. You don't have any position higher. You don't have more rewards where you could have. You don't have more fellowship time, which you could have with Christ. Because, you see, sanctification has to do with your works. Justification does not. Let me repeat that again. Justification has Christ's works application to justification, the past tense dimension. The present tense dimension, sanctification, is dependent upon your works. Because your works count to rewards in heaven, position, fellowship time with Christ, and your actual rewards are determined by the walk, the sacrifice that you do in a spiritual act of worship, Romans 12.2. Remember what I said, Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11 is the doctrine, the teaching, the kingdom of God's system. And Romans chapter 12 through 16 is the practical application of it. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is the beginning of it. And it says right after what your spiritual act of worship is in 12, 1, and goes right into what it is in 12, 2, equity. An equitable kingdom walk. 12 through 16. Is the practical application of the doctrine, chapter 1 through 11. With chapter 3 4 being justification, chapter 6 and 7 being sanctification, your works and application, resulting in chapter 8, glorification, when you die. If you're not that generation that does see death. Chapter 12, or excuse me, verse 12 in chapter 6. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Let's apply that to that system that we're all presently living. It's a sinful system, and you're allowing it to reign in you because you're obeying its lust, money, commerce, lack of love, selfish pride. Seven deadly sins. Thirteen, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness or in iniquity, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, you could plug, plug in anywhere that you see the word righteousness and you can plug in equity because righteousness in the, Old, in the New Testament is dikosimu, and dikosimu means it's fair, just, and right. And if you look up the equitable definition of equity, and equity is used in the Old Testament, if you look that definition up in the Old Testament, equity means what's fair, just, and right also. So equity in the Old Testament is the same as righteousness in the New Testament. Because if you compare the, the original text word for righteousness in the Greek, its meaning, and compare the same meaning in the Old Testament, you come up with the word equity. So equity and righteousness are synonymous. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You're not under the legal system. Why? 
because you choose the equitable system. And if you do the equity, you will not break any law. This is the reason why we are we have changed gears and stopped the uh, the old way we were doing, and we're going to the source, which is the scriptures, because the problem is not, as I said, the merger and extinguishment of your debt or obligation, but the change of systems in your life. Because if you extinguish the debt under merger or under trust, under NTT, you'll probably go back like a dog back to its vomit into the same system that caused the problem in the, in the beginning. So you've changed nothing. You're just going to run into another problem somewhere down the line. It's all about a system change. That will solve your problem. Without a system change, you're going to go back into your same sin and reap the same consequence. Fourteen, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And grace comes right out of equity. Fifty. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. In other words, that was the argument that Paul was presented with here. He said, well, that's just a license to sin, Paul. Your your grace thing that you teach is all about a license to sin. Well, no, it's not. It's not a license to sin. It's a freedom to make a choice, and now you're no longer slave to the system. You can make the choice, and you can change. Sixteen, do you not know then when you present yourselves to someone as slaves to, for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience, resulting in righteousness, resulting in equity? Hmm. The equitable blessings of God got, are gotten or had by coming into equity, doing equity, the equity obedience gets you the equitable blessing. You comes into equity, must be doing equity. Do unto others as you have them do to you. We go to church. We park in the front of the neighbor's driveway and block him in, and we go into church and sit down and think we're righteous. And we leave and we honk our horns and say, everybody get out of our way. And then when we leave, we throw our trash on the street, and we continue on. How equitable are you? What have you put on? Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, you know, in other words, just participating in the system, and the system, what you sow in the system, comes back at you as more system restraint, more lawlessness, more iniquity, resulting in further lawlessness, further iniquity, Whatever a man sows, he reaps. And it comes back to him at least on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and sometimes 30, 60, 100-fold multiplied. What system are you living in? What are you sowing? All i got to do is look at it and see what you're reaping. I'll tell you right now what you've been sowing. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, slaves to equity, folks resulting in sanctification. Sanctification, the second dimension of salvation. Your walk, your work. That's your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1.
Romans 12.1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That is chapter 6 and 7 in Romans. That's your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2 in chapter 12. And do not be conformed to this world, this system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind through a change of reasoning process, really, equitable reasoning, so that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect, discernment, due to putting on the equity eyes and doing the equitable walk, which results in your sanctification. Now, if you don't want to walk that way, Christ will do the sanctification fully for you, but you have the opportunity to reap the rewards for it in heaven mightily. If you choose not to, Christ will finish it for you, and he will fully glorify you anyway. But you'll be like the one getting into the heavens by the skin of his teeth. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, free in regard to equity. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things which you are now ashamed? The things that are inequitable, done in iniquity. For the outcome of those things is death. In other words, I mean, if you're justified, you're not going to die spiritually, but you're going to die physically. You will be without the blessings of God now. Doesn't that sound like the church today? Spiritually dry? Wondering, you know, where God is? For the outcome of those things is death. 22, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification now and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that's talking about justification there. But to sanctify, you do the changed walk, and that results in your sanctification, now that you're justified. So chapter 7. I think we may stop there and pick up on chapter 7 next week. So we'll pick up there, chapter 7, the second dimension of salvation, the present tense, part B. And we'll have 7 to complete, and then we'll move into the last dimension, glorification, which is chapter 8. So why is it important to know this? Well, it's all about a knowledge of God and what God says. And I hope you see that these three dimensions of salvation have great importance because it's the deeds that you do in sanctification that's important to you for rewards in heaven as to rewards, position, and fellowship time with Christ. And you have the opportunity now to walk the Christ walk, walk the kingdom walk, 
and put off that old system. Welcome back to Eden Project. Welcome to the Kingdom of God. Welcome to how to lose your life to save it. Welcome to how to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And all these things are phys- uh, uh, metaphorically, or uh, but they all equate to, okay, what is the kingdom walk? How do I do it? What is it I have to do? Well, stay tuned. We're going to be getting more into it. That's the Back to Eden Project. How to live a kingdom life so that I'm not participating in the system. How to eat without commerce. How to buy your gas without commerce. How to supply the needs of someone else from an empty bucket, so to speak. So I'd like to tell everybody about the good news and give an invitation out there to partake in the good news. And that's really the gospel, the good news. And the good news is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4, which to sum it up, The death and resurrection of Christ, his cross work, was all according to the scriptures. He died on a cross, was buried, and three days later arose, all according to the scriptures, for the justification or the forgiveness of your sins. And if you believe what he did and he did alone, That's what saves you. Nothing else is required. No including of works, no prayer, no inviting Christ into your heart and your life. None of that stuff, because that's not in the scriptures. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Can't be put any simpler. And if you believe that Christ did for uh, what he did for you, that he died for your forgiveness of your sins, then welcome to God's kingdom. And you are now a believer. You're justified. And now you can go on to walking a sanctified walk. And you're now a Christian, reconnected back with God. And in chapter 5, you now have peace with God. God the Father through God the Son, Jesus Christ. And not to confuse the justification Christ walk or the Christ work that that Christ did on the cross with any kind of works that you've got because you can't apply it to justification. It only applies to sanctification. And if you use that as a filter and never commingle them from one compartment to the, the other, the tenses under salvation, then that opens the scriptures up to a different interpretation which most Christians don't have because they don't have the doctrines down. They don't have the filters to come up with the correct meanings of certain scriptures because they don't have a solid foundation. They're too easily washed away when the rains come or the waves come up. Their house falls. They're like a court. It's pulled between the waves, whichever way the wind blows. Because they don't have a knowledge of Christ, doctrinally. So they can't do the Romans 12 through 16 walk properly. And that's how you can get involved into a different system and not know it. So I hope I've shed some light on the kingdom walk. Father, I'd like to thank you for what you did on the cross for not just me but for others, that it's your cross work, your 
salvation and its dimensions. It's all about you, Father, in heaven, rather than us here on earth. And to keep a heaven-centered knowledge of you, Lord, rather than a man-centered knowledge based on what we see, touch, taste, and smell here, walking by sight. Father, I'd like to thank you for those that you have drawn here to hear the gospel message, and they've had the chance to come to faith. And I hope that the words that they've heard spoke through me, your gospel presentation, that they would accept and become members of Christ's family so that they may walk in the newness of life and put on that spiritual walk and understanding so that they would have a life that is blessed now as well as a blessing eternal in heaven. And I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give that message. And I thank you for what you've done for me as well as the others. In his precious name I pray and ask in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's open up for Q&A. Press star 8 to raise your hand and get in the queue line. Star 8. Star eight, anybody question? Hello, who's this? Can't quite hear you. Say again. Oh, you're kind of garbled. Hey, how are you? Good. How's everybody doing? Hello. Yeah. Okay, let's start this over again. Anybody has a question, press star eight. Hello, Christian. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Who's this, Shaka? Yeah, it's Shaka, yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Yourself, how are you? Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was trying to get on last week, actually, and uh, the time difference caught me again. I ended up falling asleep, so um, anyway, I'm here now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few questions. I've been listening to... Um, these kingdom calls like the last three weeks or so since you started doing them and uh, I've got a few questions um, you, you said uh, at one point I think maybe on the first call that like, general equity is available to everyone whereas special equity is available only to Christians yes um, yeah could I ask you to elaborate on that or uh, the, the general equities are like the sun comes up and it shines on everybody's yard, uh, everybody's garden grows, you know, the rains come and waters everybody's yards and plants and takes care of it. The, that's, the, that's the general graces of God that is available to everyone. And anybody who sows, reaps. But it's what you sow, whether you sow equity or whether you sow iniquity. So it's the general graces of God, you know, because that's what you're going to reap, whatever you sow. Now, the, the special equities of God is only to the believers because the believers are the only ones that are going to be in heaven with God. They have the, the eternal blessing of being with God for an eternity. 
and they get the rewards of walking a sanctified life. And those rewards are not just available in heaven, but they're also available to them now. So they have, on top of the general graces, the general equity of God, they have the special on top, as well as the general. Okay. So that's uh, that's about the best way I can explain it. Okay. Um, okay. So when you say special equities, you mean um, you mean some rights or some uh, some blessings or special equity is eternal life. Special equities is blessings from heaven now. Okay. Now, what could that be? Uh, I don't know. It could be miracle signs and wonders. It could be somebody knocking on your door, giving you something that, you know, they don't know. You don't know them. You know, something can happen in your life that you just know is, you know, it's strange. It's, you know, yeah. out of place. It just happened. You know, some something it's, it's going to be extra. Okay. We can walk up and give you a house. Okay. Um, <clears throat> something else you said on a, I think on a different call, you said uh, something along the lines of um, you will cross the River Jordan and your name will change, or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, can I ask you to speak more on that, or was that just uh well it's it's figurative it's not that you have to have an actual name changed you know it's got nothing to do with the straw man's name being different or whatever you know it's it was symbolic there has to be an inward change when you cross over the old ways change to the new ways and you put off the old way of system and you put on the new system. Mm-hmm. It's a spiritual change of a different reasoning process. It's a different spiritual act of worship. It's a different way of looking at things. It's altogether different because it's a different system. That's the name change. Actually, it's talking about sanctification, really. Chapter 6 that we just went over in Romans. That's the name change. Okay. So you're talking more about your deeds, how you live. Well, you know, the first thing that they did was that when they crossed over the River Jordan to take possession of the land was they had to do what God told them to do. And when they did what God told them to do, because he basically told them to do nothing. Just march around Jericho and I will make the walls come down. It will be all to my glory because I did it all. And they were obedient to that, and God gave them the city. And that was the sign that God was with Israel from that point on. Until they threw it all away again. (laughs) When Christ came as the Messiah, he said, uh, How I wanted to gather you as a chick with the tens under its wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now your house stands desolate. And that temple veil was rent in half signifying that God has left them. That also signified that the inner holy sanctuary was open to Gentiles as believers. Because Israel rejected the Messiah, Christ the Messiah, because it lacked faith. And God has not been any different from the beginning as to now or in the end. And it's always always been about faith. God's chosen people is are God's chosen people by faith alone. And those believers, whether they be Jews or Gentiles or of any other nation of of humanity on the earth, have the ability to go right into that inner sanctuary, that holy of holies. 
and they do that by Christ the mediator, the intercessor for them. They're connected back to God. So that symbolic river crossing and its first battle has tie-ins or types and shadows applied to now. Um, this this whole question of faith, would you say it's faith based on evidence or faith based on experience or instinct or what? Um, well, it's not experiential. It's not based on experience. Uh, you know, Romans chapter 1 and 2 explains about, you know, the God's handwriting has been written in all of creation. You know, if you look at a tree, you know how wonderfully it's been put together, and you just kind of like know that that just didn't pop up all by itself. There had to be a creator for that. So all things in creation really point to the hand of God, but there's really no physical evidence directly connecting him to God, and you have to accept that by faith alone. So it's a spiritual awareness that there has to be something else, and that's really of the heart. That's the the, the inner mind knows that because of, of the equities that was written on your heart, the standard that everybody is held accountable to is written on your heart, not the Ten Commandments. That love, that love is written on your heart. You know what it is. You know what's fair, just, and right. Well, we just want it done to us, but we just don't do it to everyone else. And we know there's a, something missing in life, and we're looking for a connection back with God, and we just don't know that. And that connection is got by faith. Nicodemus in chapter 3 and John came before Jesus at night and said, you know, hey, uh, is it true what they say about you? You know, and, and what did he ask him? He didn't answer that question. He hit him with another question. He started talking about spiritual things and said, hey, you got to be born again. He said, Nicodemus, come on, guy, get, get with the program here. You're the top dog of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and you don't understand spiritual things? He said, you've got to be reborn again, born again in the spirit. You've got to have the equitable spirit of God in you. You've got to be thinking about equitable substances, equitable principles. That's the spirit of God, the way he thinks. And he thinks that he's come up with a plan of salvation and he's talking about justified which comes back you know everybody thinks they got to have a job no you don't need a job what you need is the book of Job <laughs> book of Job says how does a man stand righteous before God that's really the question that's your job how to stand righteous before God and the first step is justification by faith. And the second step is sanctification in a walk. And the third step is glorification, which is all finished. So one of the special graces of God is that he puts a hedge around you. That he's your rear guard. That he's your rampart. He's your buckler, your shield. He's your sword. He's everything. And you don't have to do anything. You just have to walk. And the ground will magically appear for the next step. Step out in faith. Like walking across the Grand Canyon on thin air, but really you're on solid ground because I'm walking in the hands of God. Just like Peter was said... Lord, is that you? 
command me to come out on the boat, out of the water. I really think that Peter didn't have to ask that. He could have got out on that boat. He could have walked out there as long as he kept his eyes on Christ. Another special attribute from God would be the, the gifts that he gives you through the sealing of the Holy Spirit after you've been justified and come to faith. Mm-hmm. So, what else? Um, okay, um. I was wondering if you might have some comments on uh, the passage from biblical scripture, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Um, It's interesting how, you know, some people interpret that as evidence of, uh, you know, like a pacifist type of slave-like approach of just paying taxes, while others interpret it as inspiration to um, do the opposite. So I was just wondering, you know, what, what comments you might have on that. Well, notice he said elsewhere that, you know, talking about the tax, who the tax is owed. He said, are the heirs of the king subject to tax? And Peter said, no, of course not. They don't pay tax. And then neither are the sons of God. Mm. But at this time he said, Go into the fish's mouth and get the coin out of the fish and go pay the tax for you and I so that they would not complain because, you know, the time is not yet. Yeah, give Caesar what Caesar is due and what God God is due. That's really the separation of the two kingdoms. Which kingdom do you want to live in? You want to live in God's kingdom, but yet time might not be just right yet. Pay the tax so as not to uh, alarm them. Yeah. But I think everyone needs to make the kingdom change. You know, something about God, he never gives you something more than you can do. And if it requires something, then he always comes up with the something that you need to accomplish what he purposes you to do. Mm. So Caesar's realm requires commerce. Uh, God's realm doesn't. God's realm is a house of prayer. What's prayer? Well, you ask God for what you need. But how many of us have a fellowship directly with that Elohim's kingdom council and can actually walk in there and have a face-to-face chat? Or are we still stuck at Mount Zion and Mount Horeb there, you know, shaking in our boots due to the thunder and the lightning on top of the mountain? Mm. You know, the kingdom of uh, God is like equivalent to Eden, and Eden is Zion, and they're all the same. They're the holy council up in the heavenlies where the Elohim meet, and God holds his council. Now, God's an Elohim, but he is the top Elohim. He's the Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. What else? Um, well, 
that's I think that's about it for now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to see if I could uh, prompt you to speak on a few things, and uh, I think you've given us enough to go uh, to go think on. So I'll try to come up with some more questions next time. Well, I think the most probably the most pressing questions for Christians is, well, how do I put off this old system? And what is it that I put on? In other words, you know, if I leave this commercial realm, how am I going to eat? Because I'm not leaving this commercial realm if I can't see how I'm going to eat. Hmm. How do we buy a house? How do we pay for our gas? How do we pay for our, our food that we need? Like, show me that, and then I'll make the kingdom jump. See, most most of us don't walk by faith. We walk by sight. Yeah. We don't walk by principles. We walk by what we see. That's part of the spiritual blindness that Satan's put upon us, and that's part of the habit that we are still locked in. Although we've had the power to break the habit, we just choose not to. Yeah. But we're stuck in a rut. We're stuck in a system. Because that's all we know. And we won't walk out of that system because we can't see the other system. Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to show people the other system so they can walk out of it. And each one of us has to make the choice themselves to walk out of the old system. And it all starts with the first step, which is justification by faith. And the next thing is, the next step is sanctification walk. And that's probably the hardest right there. But that's what a pastor's job is, to take those that are justified and to get them to walk a sanctified walk, which is probably the harder job. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's what we're probably shooting for. That's what probably want, everybody wants the answers to. And the answer really is they need to read their scriptures more. <laughs> they need to read it with understanding. And the understanding is knowing about the doctrines and how to use those as filters to get the correct interpretation so that things connect and harmonize rather than become conflicts. Because all of scriptures does not conflict itself. If there's any conflicts in scriptures, it's because we're trying to connect two passages in scriptures that do never were intended to connect together. And we do the correction of that, we harmonize it, and we harmonize it with these doctrines that I've laid out. And it's through the the uh, the five that I gave that I say that I believe and what the scriptures say are doctrines, and the three dimensions of salvation or uh, the three compartments of salvation because all of scriptures applies to one of those three compartments. You can't take a justification passage and apply it to a sanctification compartment. There's going to be a conflict. So you have to twist your interpretation around your mind and not bend the scriptures, but bend your mind, bend your understanding, come to a harmonization of the scriptures, because you're trying to connect two compartments that never were supposed to be connected, justification with sanctification. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that's really the one main issue for Paul, talking about in Romans 3 and 4, that by faith alone, and James in 2.19, talking about a man is justified by his works. That's an apparent conflict. Um, Then you bear Titus with Paul in support against that understanding of what James is saying. But James is really in line with Paul and Titus and the other apostles. It's just that the wrong interpretation of James 2.19 is not you're justified by your works, you're justified in sanctification by your works. 
Now, if you interpret it that way, you've harmonized the scriptures, and now it connects. Now there's no conflict. Mm. Because your works apply to sanctification, not justification. Um, that, that reminds me of something else I wanted to ask you, actually. Okay, one well. more point. It's the, not the literal wording of the scripture, but it's the spiritual meaning it's the spirit of the scriptures. Because there are some places that the scriptures are written in such a way that you could go one way or the other. And what's going to keep you on the right path? Following the spiritual way. And the spiritual way is using the doctrines, as I explained. That will keep you on the right track. There will be no conflicts. Mm-hmm. Had something else? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask you about this, uh, the compartments, the three compartments. Um, okay. Is, is that something that you, uh, I mean, are there scriptures that uh, you kind of picked that out of or did you kind of figure that out yourself? This idea that there's three compartments that don't mix. Well, it's in the scriptures, uh, you know, and I've been pointing out where they're at. It's just that maybe people just weren't aware, but that's what salvation consists of. Salvation consists of justification, sanctification, glorification. And where are those in the scriptures? That's chapter 3 and 4, 6 and 7, and 8. Yeah. Okay. I mean, right there they are. You know, you got to read it. That's all. Yeah. Anything else? Well, okay then. Um. No. No, I think that's me done now. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I think that's me done. I'll, like I said, I'll try and come up with some more questions next time. All right, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot then, Christian. Hey, okay, thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Okay, who's next? Hey, Christian. Hello, who's this? That's Mark out here in California. Hi, how are you doing, Mark? I'm doing great. Hey, I'm kind of a newbie. I was starting to listen to some of your older stuff, and then uh, you changed <laughs> changed venues. So I'm really uh, looking forward to this new venue. I tell you, I, I think one of my biggest uh, downfalls is I'm so looking, so starved for the truth. I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm with a couple other study groups that uh, I kind of liked when I heard uh, uh, some of your older stuff. And I, you know, again, I know you're moving in a different direction. So, um, kind totally of not a different direction. It's just we stopped and now we're just moving forward. We've kind of right. grown. Okay. I mean, we're like been walking around the mountain. God has walking around the mountain. Yeah. And we made one revolution around and we got back to the same place. And now it's, hey, we're walking up the mountain now. Okay, okay, got you. Um, but um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I guess my main question is, because is, I'm really trying to wrap my head around this, not just being involved in commerce. And I mean, there's all kinds of questions I could ask about that. But I, I guess while I was listening, I thought, well, how can I get to make this real simple. And I'm, I'm wondering, is there anybody, any culture, anybody on this planet right now that you know of that is living without, I mean, is there anybody that, you, I mean, that we could, uh, that we could emulate, you know, that uh, you could point to? I mean, or is this, or is this really so, I don't want to say new, but so uh, cutting edge that what you're talking about is like never been done before. I don't know of anybody out there that has put on the eyes of equity and is teaching it with the eyes of equity, the scriptures. I think everybody has a legal bent, legal basis coming from rather than an equitable basis. And, and, and this doesn't involve just, you know, not to spill the beans or anything, but does this involve anything that you've talked so far? Is this totally like, 
you know what I'm saying? I mean, when you, from what I've what I've heard regarding trust, is you had uh, looked like you were kind of going in the direction of, uh, you know, getting the becoming the beneficiary of the trust, but you're also saying though that that, that basically gets us into commercial, and you know, most of us would probably blow our brains out with all the money, all the money that we get. So, I think most subject. people have a misconception of what the private trust really is. The private trust is really the trust that God has with you. Okay. And that's pretty much where you're going with this. Yeah, yeah. it really doesn't involve commerce. It involves substance. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Um, like I said, I had other questions, but I'm just going to sit here and listen and be, uh, be in tune in uh, these calls, so I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing that, Bill. Okay, like I said, it's not so much as a merger extinguishment of the debt, although yeah, I can see where that would be good for people. But trouble is, I'm afraid that they would probably go right back to the same system they're trying to get out of. Yeah. And really, that's it's kind of like defeating the whole purpose. So that's why we're moving on because now we're talking about a system change. To really not fall on back into the problem, you got to have a system change. Right. Got it. Well, we, don't direct, we don't change the system that we live under. We're going to be doing the same thing that we tried to get away from. Sounds good. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm all ears. My heart's open. My mind's open. Okay, well, stay tuned. Okay. We're laying down some uh, groundwork, you know, first, and then... We're going to build upon that on a solid foundation. Awesome. Well, let's talk to you soon. Yeah. And the amount of time that you spend on the foundation determines the size and height of the building. Love it. Okay, anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for coming on, Mark. Yeah, see you next week. Okay, we've got a clear board. Anybody have any questions? Press star 8. Star 8, anybody? Got an open board. Star 8 for any questions? Star 8, anyone? Star 8, going once. Anybody question? Star eight. Star eight going twice. Last call. Star eight going three times. Okay, we'll call it a show. So I'd like to send out a request out there to anyone who has uh, who, who wants to take and uh, donate some time to help in the the uh, the transcripts. I'm trying to think of the word. Doing the transcripts, taking the recordings and writing them down uh, into a transcript. If anybody wants to volunteer for that, get a hold of uh, Faith to Trust. We're looking for some people to uh, take about a 10-minute segment of each audio and then convert it to a, a text, if anybody is interested in that. So we need some volunteers for that. Okay, we got one, one more. We'll take one more. All right. Who's... Go ahead, caller. You're unmuted. Hi, Christian Ishaka again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I was trying to squeeze in before you counted down, but um, I, I just wanted to ask the question. Uh, in the Skype group, there was a little discussion going about the spiritual laws being written or unwritten. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to quickly come in and ask ask you about that, if you could share some comments on that. Well, that's just exactly what uh, John chapter 3 was stating to Nicodemus. He was saying, you know, you guys interpret the laws as being written, 
but it's the spiritual the spiritual side of the law. He was telling them, you know, that you leave an ox in the pit on the Sabbath because you say the law says that you can't do any work on the Sabbath. But the spirit of the law says you take the ox out of the pit. That's what he condemned the Pharisees for. Interpreting the law... And he says, you've forgotten the substance, the weightier provision of the law, which is the equitable or the spiritual side of the law. And that's the main conflict that he had with the Pharisees and Sadducees all along, was their way of interpreting the law wrongly. And that's the thing that got him killed, because that's why they plotted against him. They didn't trust what he was saying because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. (laughs) Okay. You know, the scriptures are written, but how are you interpreting it? Are you interpreting the Bible as a spiritual book with spiritual reasoning, with equity eyes? Or are you going to see all the laws for what they state and do them exactly walk for walk, inch by inch, and you're bound by the literal interpretation of the law? And it's the spirit of the law that sets you free. Now, are not the laws all spiritual, it says? Well, that was in reference to the Ten Commandments. Yes, because the Ten Commandments should reflect equity, and they do. They do. But the laws that man makes from these interpretations of the scriptures wrong, those don't reflect equity. And if they do, do we enforce those laws right? And right has to do with right, fair, and just, which is equity again. Yeah. Let me just make one thing about, to say, the, the stop sign law. If you don't come to a complete stop, you get a ticket. That's the literal interpretation of the law. What's the substance? The substance says, well, was there an accident caused? Well, no, not really. Uh, did you look both ways? Oh, uh, yeah, I did. Uh, uh, did you intend to cause an accident? No, not really. Was there an accident? No, not really. Okay, was the substance of the law uh, fulfilled? Absolutely. Then why am I being ticketed? You see, the law is equitable to as a warning that this is a dangerous intersection. Pay attention. Don't cause an accident. But because I didn't do a literal stop, I get fined? That's not the substance of the law. That law is equitable in not causing an accident to remind you, watch out, this is a dangerous intersection. And we need that law. But how is it being enforced? So you can take an equitable law and nullify it by a false interpretation, by a literal interpretation of the law. Cut out the substance, and you lost the heart of the law. That's what Bouvier says. Mm. Law is nothing without equity, and equity is everything even without law. Equity is the soul and spirit of the law. That's why I love that quote. Yeah. We may have many statutes and codes today that are equitable, but they're not being enforced equitably. So they turned the equitable law into an iniquity and nullified it. That's just exactly what Jesus was saying back in the Old Testament. You guys have nullified the law. It's better that you have done the latter instead of the former. You have forgotten the substance. Woe to you Pharisees and Sadducees. You strain out the gnat and let a camel slide by. He was on them for their false interpretation. 
leaving the spirit of the law out and enforcing the literal legality of it. The Ten Commandments are part of equity. They are the judgment side of not doing equity. But we have made statutes and codes like the Ten Commandments, but we've left out the substance, the equity principles behind it. And now we're enforcing hollow laws without any real meaning. And we're doing it for commerce because the statutes and codes are all commercial. And commercial is not God's kingdom. So he, let him who has ears, let him hear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay then, Christian. Thanks for that, yeah? Good question. Anything else? Um, no, no, uh, no. That's it now. Okay. I'm finished. Yeah. All right. Well, appreciate you coming back on. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks a lot. See you next week. Okay. All right. Okay, I'd like to thank you all for coming to NTT's Kingdom of God with the Eyes of Equity, and thank you for attending the How to Live a Kingdom Life, and welcome, thank you for attending Back to the Eden Project. And we'll see you all next week, and we'll walk around the mountain again. All right, praise the Lord, everyone. Let everyone have his breath. Praise the Lord. Night, all.